He has uh, performed uh, as Mark Twain for over a dozen years now, including on Broadway at the Proyas Club and on a uh, paddle wheel riverboat in on the Mississippi. Robert's unique and humorous interpretation of Mark Twain uh, to, to the stage. He also ran for president as Mark Twain in the 2016 elections, <laughs> noting that he came back from the hereafter at the request of the Supreme Being to do so. <laughs> so, without further ado, Mr. Rob Alvey, Mark Twain. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to present to you a man whose great learning and veneration for truth are only exceeded by his high moral character and majestic presence. <laughs> <laughs> I refer in these vague and ungeneral terms to myself. I consider introductions unnecessary. But if it is the custom to have introductions, I prefer to do the act myself so I can get in all the facts. I was born modest. <laughs> but it wore off. <laughs> I was once presented to an audience by a lawyer who kept his hands in his pockets. He introduced me as Mark Twain, a humorist who is really funny, a rare creature indeed, while I was struck speechless by this complimentary thunderbolt. I scarcely in my life listened to a string of accolades and compliments so beautifully phrased or so well deserved. <laughs> I also observed we had a much rarer creature in our midst than a humorist who was really funny. <laughs> we had a lawyer who kept his hands in his own pockets. <laughs> Lawyers and congressmen are a well-earned reputation for being able to talk excessively with all sorts of flowery language and certainties and a spew of outlandish facts that have no factual basis and opinions that they sh assure us are everyone's, whether we agree or with them or not, and talk so as to actually not accomplish anything. If God had waited for a congressman to finish speaking before he proclaimed, let there be light, we'd all still be in the dark. Oh, but I do like compliments. We all do, humorists, burglars, congressmen, all of us in the trade. The plan of the newspapers is good. If you can't get a compliment any other way, pay yourself one. I do that often. I can do that right now. I can state that there are two men who are most remarkable. Kipling is one. And I am the other. Between us, we cover all knowledge of things. Kipling knows all there is to know about everything. And I know the rest. Oh. <laughs> the truth of the matter is let people think you are stupid rather than open your mouth and give the proof. Oh. <laughs> A few politicians uh, take that advice. Uh, but you know, I am extremely intelligent. As you know, the intelligence scale is a curve, 
and mine is so high it goes completely to the very top of the intelligence curve and then descends down on the other side slowly and pops out around Egypt. <laughs> That's where my distinct judgment skills have originated. When I was putting together my first book, I did a stretch in Washington. I knew was a newspaper correspondent, and every day I went over to Congress and reported on the inmates there. It was very entertaining. One of them got a bill passed to construct a dam where there wasn't any water. <laughs> But they didn't find out about it until they had built the dam. So then they had an investigation to see if they could build a river to save the dam. I made idiots first. That was for practice. Then he made Congress. If we could learn what the human race really is at the bottom, we only need to observe it in election times. Get your facts first, then you can distort them at your leisure. I have always wondered why God invented lawyers. Did his mind wander? The more I see of lawyers, the more I favor hanging. <laughs> but I have to say, it's good to be down here in Florida. I visited a few times. I want to thank you for attending the services here this evening. I nearly missed it myself. I came by the Flagler Railroad. It was one of those trains that gets tired every seven minutes or so and has to stop and rest for about a half an hour. One of the passengers advised the conductor to take the cow catcher off the front of the train and put it on the rear of the train because at the rate we're going, we're not likely to hit any cows, but there's not stopping them from climbing aboard the back. <laughs> if I have to go to heaven by a railroad, I think I'm certain I will go the other way. There was even a dog that got on board early in the morning and barked steadily at nothing the whole trip. I had never quite seen one of that kind before. It was a long, low dog with very short legs, kind of like the parentheses turned the wrong way. It was made on the plan of a bench, really, and it seemed to be satisfied, but I thought the plan structurally weak on account of the distance between the forward supports and those of the rear. It seemed to me it would have been a stronger and more practical dog if it had more legs. I didn't ask what kind of dog it was, although the owner seemed to be proud of it. Said it had taken prizes at dog shows. Said people also stopped him on the street to look at it. Well, this did not seem strange to me. I said, I could have told them if you had a long, great, low dog like that and could waddle along the street anywhere in the world and not charge anything, people will stop and stare. <laughs> Why, if I were built like that, I could take prizes myself. I had originally intended to spend some time at the Fort Lauderdale pool, but discovered it was not a pool for billiards, but really a pool filled with holes with water for little kids to spend time swimming and splashing and drinking and wet and making a ton of noise. The noises coming from those youngsters was overwhelmingly and excessively loud and as terrorizing as the screams of the cannibals I heard back in my days as a reporter in the Sandwich Islands. I could not in all honesty understand why some adult didn't take advantage of the opportunity to drown the darn little kids in the pool and give the rest of us old timers some much needed peace and quiet. Now, as a writer and book publisher, I certainly did not pass up the opportunity to visit the Fort Lauderdale Public Library spending a bit of time to know how many of my own works are on the shelves. Oh, or how often they've been taken out for reading. A few of my books are considered classics. 
Now, the word classic, I found, means that many people have a copy of the book or know someone who has a copy of the book or know someone who has read it, but they never admit that they haven't read it themselves or know anybody who actually has. The definition of classic must mean, I'll get around to it someday. <laughs> it's a book which people praise and figure someone else has read so they don't have to. <laughs> now, I did happen to see a copy of Tom Sawyer, as well as a copy of Huckleberry Finn on the shelf. They were dusty, but I was pleased. Buck Finn has helped me out, make a tiny bit of money. Some libraries have banned it, burned it publicly. The moral crusaders in those towns publicly proclaimed the book to be scandalous, controversial, racist, irrelevant, lewd, and not fit for children. Whenever I hear that, I immediately print up another 25,000 copies and usually sell them out in a week. Now, I did find several copies of a popular children's book Harry Potter yeah. and the Prisoner of Azkaban and the Library. While this book may not be a classic in a hundred years, but it sure seems to have been read by a number of folks. And I hear some thinking to the situation, and I decided it's time for me to write a brand new book. But I learned over the years that an author can make much more money when he writes a series of books based on the same characters. So I'm still deciding on what to call the book, but my work and title is The Further Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and Harry Potter <laughs> <laughs> on Star Trek. <laughs> with James Bond. <laughs> oh, that's going to be a classic. I remember growing up. It was a long time ago. I didn't have white hair in those days. It didn't rain so much in the summer then. The sunsets were redder. There were more old people. The world was full of them. And now it's full of young people. It's funny. You'd expect it to be the other way around. <laughs> to put human life simply, birth is simply the beginning. Life is merely the journey, and death is merely the final destination. We all share that equally, and yet there is not one person amongst us who at one time or another has wanted to help another person take a shortcut on their journey through life and get them to their final destination as quick as possible. <coughs> now the gods offer no rewards for intellect. There never was one god yet that showed any interest in it. Faith is believe in what may not be so. My advice is to simply be good. To be good is noble. But to show others how to be good is noble and no trouble. However, be good and you will be lonesome. <laughs> you had to stop and think about that. <laughs> we'll get to that final destination someday. But I have to tell you this I've been gone for about 110 years, and I came back for a couple of reasons. But I just want to let you know that heaven is not quite the paradise we were taught to expect. Most of it is zoned no smoking. <laughs> there are plenty of dogs in heaven and a few cats but only enough for the entertainment of the dogs <laughs> man after all a dog is truly man's best friend and his loyalty to man is unsurpassed simple but love <laughs> loyal wow you can do a simple experiment to prove a dog is man's best friend. 
It goes like this. You take the large box and you puts it down and you like a steam truck and you opens it up and then you goes and gets your dog and you puts him in the box. Then you go over and get your wife and you squat her over and say, honey, get in the box. Oh. And you put her in the box too. Now you need one more thing, so you go over and get your mother-in-law. <laughs> and you grab her and you put her in the box too. And then you close the lid. And then you sit on it. <clears throat> Maybe 30, 45 minutes. Have a cigar. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get up and open the lid, who's going to be happy to see you? <laughs> Man's best. <laughs> now, the Supreme Man wanted me to let you know that your many, many messages and verbal pleas have been received. They are all heard. But I have to report to you that God's last name is not, damn it. No. <laughs> the biggest surprise I had when I first landed in heaven was to discover that the supreme being, the very creator of the universe, the solar system on our own little planet, does not in the least resemble an omnipotent and wise old human but it's actually a large dog. <laughs> the dog's name is Lordy. A fine and fitting name for a dog or a supreme being. Many of my southern friends have unknowingly called on her help by simply crying out, Oh, Lordy! <laughs> and Lordy's a mother. She's a good dog and smart. It seems our early religious writers may have been aware of the great dog but were dyslexic, and they spelled it backwards in the first religious book, and nobody had the gumption to correct it. It has been a bit of embarrassment by the great dog ever since, and when you think about it, it's perfectly obvious that a dog created the earth, since it's round like a ball and does shake occasionally. It's something dogs like to play with. Besides, the dog is man's best friend, and the great dog made sure there were humans on the planet to be companions to the dogs. <laughs> now, I like cats, too. They're quieter than children. I like everything about cats except their singing voices. We have one, a Presbyterian soprano. She's partial to hymns, sings old 100 every night on a picket fence out back of the house. It's useless to shout at her. She takes it for applause and tries harder. But I have often thought how beautiful she would be in death. <laughs> but a cat is a fine animal. If you could cross a man with a cat, you'd improve the man, but deteriorate the cat. <laughs> now, animal minds are simple. Animals never spend time dividing experience into little bits and speculate about the bits they missed. The whole panoply of the universe is expressed to them as A, things to mate with. B, things to eat. C, things to run away from. And D, rocks. <laughs> this frees the mind from unnecessary thought and gives it a cutting edge where it matters. Your normal animal, in fact, never tries to walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> Man was built at the end of the word week's work when God was tired. <laughs> Oh, such is the human race. Often it does seem such a pity that Noah didn't miss the boat. <laughs> Man is the only animal that has the true religion. Several of them. Yeah. <laughs> there was a man who died, and St. Peter welcomed him to heaven, so tell, and asked what denomination he was. The man replied, Baptist. So St. Peter 
escorted him to room 12, but asked him to be quiet as they passed room 6. Another man died, and St. Peter, finding that the man was a Methodist, escorted him to room 14, but told him to hush when they passed room 6. Then a Lutheran couple died, and St. Peter led them to room 7, but he told them not to make any noise when you go by room 6. And a Mormon man and his three wives were killed in an accident, and St. Peter walked them to room 23 and 24. <laughs> but advised them to keep quiet when they passed room six. One of the wives asked why, and St. Peter told them, that's for the Catholics. They think they're the only ones here. <laughs> I knew a man, Jim Bushwell, who spent his entire life diligently trying to acquire the heavenly life. After Jim died and reached heaven, wouldn't you know the first person he met was one in open all the time would be in hell? Jim was so disappointed and outraged that he inquired the way to hell, then picked up his suitcase and left. So there you have it. Heaven for climate, but hell for society. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you don't mind if I smoke. Oh, Lord, it. <laughs> there is a God. Thank you. <laughs> I believe there's some commandment against smoking when you're in an insurrection of this dignified nature, but I'm working to remove it. Mind you, I don't have any problem about abstinence as long as it doesn't harm anybody. I practice it on myself on occasion. I make it a rule never to smoke when I'm asleep. Oh. <laughs> it's not that I care for moderation myself. I just do it as an example for others. I have to prove that I'm not a slave to the habit. I can give it up any time I want. In fact, I've done it a thousand times. <laughs> First time I gave up smoking, I was in four, about 10 or 11. They told me it would shorten my life by 10 years by smoking, so I got scared and gave it up for a day. <laughs> and after two or three hours. Then I decided that that decade would not be worth living without me smoking in it, so I went back and let the cigar, and that's the end of it. Now, another time I gave it up on the advice of a doctor, I had been confined to bed for several days with a lumbago, and the doctor finally said, Twain, my remedies haven't got a chance. Considering what they have to fight against the, besides the lumbago, you smoke extravagantly. You eat all manner of things that don't agree with each other's company, and you drink two large tumblers of scotch every night, don't you? Yes, but I only drink the scotch as a preventative for toothache. Oh. <laughs> I've never had a toothache. <laughs> I don't intend to ever have a toothache. He <laughs> said, that's all right, but we can't make any progress that way. You have to moderate things. I said, I can't do that, doctor. And he says, why can't you? I said, because I lack the willpower. I can cut them off entirely, but I can't moderate them. Well, that will have to do. So I cut off all those things for two days and two nights. And at the end of that time, the lumbago was discouraged and left me. I was a well man again, and I gave thanks, and I took to these delicacies once more and lit a cigar. Ah. But they won't let me light it in here. <laughs> so use your imagination. You know, up in heaven, heaven is no smoking. But I would hang out in the heavenly billiards hall. And we would light our head, our cigars, off the burning heads of lawyers. And you see, there's only one hereafter. And what is heaven for most of us is hell for them. Because they're in a place where people don't want or need anything. And no matter what they say, people just stick arms and their heads start to go on fire. 
I'm glad he's recording that. Uh, it just made that one up. <laughs> now, I was born in Missouri, and my father died when I was 12. I wound up getting an experience in a variety of trades, printing, writing, merchandising, and eventually became a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi. <sighs> Love that career. When the Civil War broke out, however, I joined up with the South, being a patriotic youth from Missouri. I did not stay a soldier for too long, though. I liked the way I looked in a fancy uniform, and marching and practicing was okay. But I kept wanting to practice retreat. <laughs> I quickly learned an important point. Never march to a battlefield where the vultures look overfed. <laughs> As the march to our first battle commenced, I had the misfortune to get sidetracked by a wonderful, beautiful wildflower growing along the side, and I went down to pick it up and accidentally tore my sleep on a thorn. So I returned to the camp to change my shirt. I missed the entire firefight, but later saw a buzzard circling the far field. So I went west on an overland stage to seek my fortune in the civil land of the Nevada Territory. I eventually settled in Virginia City, which is a good place for a man to lose his religion, but it already left by the time I got there. There were wide open gambling places, murders, street rides, fights, a whiskey mill every 16 steps, a half dozen jails, and some talk about building a church. It's no place for a Presbyterian, and I did not remain one for very long. I eventually left Virginia City and went to San Francisco, where I became unemployed. I spent a considerable amount of time looking for a job, but this was difficult because I really didn't want any actual work. <laughs> but then Lady Luck happened to smile upon me, and I was given a post on the Sacramento Union paper as a special correspondent to the Sandwich Islands. Well, our first stop was Honolulu. I was anxious to explore the fully of this dreamy and enchanted place. They told me the best way to do so was to hire a horse. So I had some unpleasant experiences in Kansas City. I once made a mistake of buying a genuine thoroughbred on the advice of a man. I found that was the auctioneer's brother. As soon as I had mounted that horse, he put all his feet together in a bunch, lowered his back, and shot me straight up in the air four or five feet. I came down again, landed in the saddle. He shot me up again, this time almost on the saddle, which was getting to be too much variety for me. I decided to get off. But well, I was in the air again, and before I could find out which way to go, the thoroughbred horse was gone, and I landed on the ground. <laughs> As I got myself up off the ground, I made up my mind that if the auctioneer's brother's funeral took place while I was in that town again, I'd postpone all recreation and then attend it. <laughs> well, Experience like this increases a man's respect for dumb animals, so in Honolulu, I ruled out a fast horse and said, I want a safe one. I asked for an excessively gentle horse with no spirit whatsoever. A lame one if they had it. <laughs> well, they showed me an animal that looked like it wanted to lean up against something, so I chose him. He went along peacefully enough but so absorbed in meditation, it began to worry me. I thought, this horse is planning some sort of outrage. No horse ever thought over a subject more, more profoundly just for nothing. I just kept going up and down. The more the thing preyed on my mind, the more frightened I got. And the more I rode, the more worried I got for my life. Finally, I dismounted to see if there was anything wild in his eye. 
And I can't tell you what a relief it was to find out he had just fallen asleep. <laughs> well, about noon, I spurred my animated trance alongside a sandy beach where I noticed a bevy of new young native ladies bathing in the sun. This was the sort of local color I was after uh, for my newspaper. <laughs> so I went down and sat on their clothes <laughs> to keep them from being stolen. And I begged them to come out, for it seemed to me the sea was getting rough and rising. I was satisfied they were running some risk, but they went right along with their sports, swimming races and splashing about. It was such a heartwarming spectacle. When I finally turned to leave, I was surprised to find the horse had fallen asleep again, which goes to show you there's a difference between a man and a horse. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot rely on him to gather the news. Oh. <laughs> I once interviewed the king of the Solomon Islands, and he said, we understand Christianity. We have eaten the missionaries. Oh, oh that kept that trip a little short. <laughs> well, after my adventures out there in the Sandwich Islands, I got back to San Francisco, and I arrived back with a bad cold. To cure it, the hotel clerk advised me to take a drink of whiskey every 24 hours. Another advised me the same thing. That was after a while, they had up to half a gallon. <laughs> I've been drunk before, but that was a masterpiece. Uh, and then after my adventures on the Pacific coast, I went east. I met a young woman by the name of Olivia Langdon. Livy's mother was a little wary of me, and I was wary of her in the same sense that two pit bulls are wary of each other before they fight. <laughs> Mrs. Langdon promised to be the fulfillment of every horror story that has been passed down through the centuries of the evils of the demon known as the mother-in-law. <laughs> But she gave me two wonderful and long-lasting gifts. The first was she consented to allow Livy to marry me. And the second gift was just as rare and precious. She died. <laughs> Livy and I were married, and she reformed me for a while. Well, during the first few decades of our marriage, we lived in Hartford, Connecticut, which, as you know, is a city whose fame as an insurance center is renowned throughout the world. As a matter of fact, we citizens of Hartford have a reputation for being a triple band of brothers working sweetly hand in hand. First, there's the Colt Gun Company making the destruction of our race easy and convenient. Second, there's the life insurance companies paying for the victims as they pass away. And third, there's our fire insurance comrades taking care of them after they're gone. <laughs> well, after I had been sufficiently notorious up in Hartford, I became a director in one of those accident insurance companies. And I want to tell you, it gave me a whole new outlook on accidents. Why, I was at a fire and I happened to recognize an elderly client of ours leaning out of a third-story window, yelling for help. Well, everybody in the crowd looked up, but nobody did anything. Nobody had any presence of mind but me. I came to the rescue. I yelled for a rope. When I took it, I took one end of it and threw it up to the old man. He caught it. And I told him, put it around and tie it around your waist. He did so, and I pulled him down. Oh. <laughs> In 
know there's nothing for a beneficial than accident insurance. Well, I've known whole families to be lifted right out of poverty. I've had people come to me on crutches with tears in their eyes to bless this beneficent institution. And in all my experiences in life, I've never seen anything as wonderful as a look that comes into a freshly mutilated man's face when he feels in his pocket with his remaining hand and oh. finds his accident policy safe and sound. <laughs> uh, now, I'd like to take just a few minutes to read one of my favorite stories, so pardon me. I hope it's a short story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you wanted me to read a story out loud. To yeah. You. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you one of my stories. It's a children's story. Be patient and listen carefully. Once upon a time in a forest far away lived a beautiful little girl with the most gorgeous blonde hair you ever saw. It was very long, very shiny, and very curly. I mean, it really got your attention. So it was only natural that this little beautiful girl with a gorgeous, long, shiny, curly hair would be called Goldilocks. She must have had a real name long ago, but this story is so old, no one remembers it. Everybody just do her as Goldilocks. One morning, when she was both doing her homework, Goldilocks decided to go for a walk in the woods. Instead, and also living in the woods, was a family of three bears. The Papa Bear, the Mama Bear, and the wee little baby bear. They lived in a simple cottage in the woods. Now, this particular morning, Mama Bear, who was a very domestic had gotten up early to make breakfast. She made porridge, which is a hot cereal and a very good with honey. The breakfast, however, was so hot that when it came to the table, the <coughs> papa bear said, Oh, let's go for a walk in the woods so the porridge can cool off. So off they went. And a short time later, Goldilocks saw the cottage and walked up to the front door. She knocked, but there was no answer. <coughs> Anybody else would have turned and left, but not Goldilocks. She turned the handle and the door swung open. But when she called again and there was no answer, Goldilocks walked right into the house to look around. She saw the three bowls of porridge and she tasted them. Papa Bear's was too hot, Mama Bear's was too cold, and Baby Bear's was just right, so she ate it all up. You know, I wonder about that girl's manners. No one home and she invites herself to lunch. <laughs> now, anybody else would have left, but not all oh, Goldilocks. She thought she'd have a little rest first, so she sat down in Papa's chair, but it was too hard. Then she sat down in Mama's chair, and it was too soft. Then you guessed it. She moved right over to Baby Bear's chair and said, this chair is just right. But suddenly the chair broke and splintered apart and Goldilocks landed it on the floor with a smack. Well, you might think that after you've broken into a house, eaten that food and broken a chair, you might slow down a bit or other things, but not Goldilocks. She went into the bedroom and laid down on Papa Bear's bed, but again it was too hard. She then scooted over to Mama's bed bed and as she sank and she said, oh, this is too soft. Then she guessed it. She climbed into Baby Bear's bed and said, Oh, this is just right. And she snuggled under the covers and fell asleep. Now, about that time in the other part of the forest, Papa Bear said, I think it's getting hungry. Let's go home. So they went home. 
And they noticed the chairs in the living room had all been sat in. And the porridge had been tasted. And they went upstairs and Papa Bear whispered, look, someone's sleeping in our room. And baby bed, someone's been sleeping in my bed there and they're still in it. That woke Goldilocks up, and she was very surprised to see three bears looking down at her, so she let out a very loud scream. So Papa Bear then pounced on her and bit her head off in one bite. And Papa Bear picked up the body, carried it downstairs, and cooked it in the oven. And the three bears then ate Goldilocks for lunch with four muffins and were content once more. The end. The moral is simply to remember to mind your manners when you go exploring in the woods and don't wander into a bear's house uninvited. The other moral lesson is that my wife, Libby, never let me read any more bedtime stories to my young children after this one. They were both satisfied after that and the girl slept better. Now, I suppose I should actually read from a book I've actually written. This comes from a book called Roughing It, which is about my experiences when I first headed west with my brother Orion to the Nevada territories. We took a stagecoach all the way from Missouri to Carson City. There was a recent silver and gold mining boom going on, and the book is about my experiences trying to be a prospector even though I didn't like any work. Everyone's familiar with Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, but I like this book, as it's somewhat my autobiography, and the success of this led me to decide to stay alive and write more. The Pony Express Ride. In a little while, all interest was taken up stretching our necks and watching for the pony rider. The fleet messenger sped across the continent from St. Joe to Sacramento, carrying letters 1,900 miles in eight days. Think of that for imperishable horse and human flesh and blood to do. The pony rider was usually a little bit of a man, brimming full of spirit and endurance, no matter what time of day or night his watch came on, and no matter whether it was winter or summer, raining, snowing, hailing, or sleeting, or whether his beat was a leveled straight road, or a crazy trail over mountain crags or precipices, or whether it led through peaceful regions, or swarmed with hostile Indians. He must always be ready to leap into the saddle and be off like the wind. There was no idling time for a pony rider on duty. He rode 50 miles without stopping by daylight, by moonlight, starlight, or through the blackness of darkness, just as it happened. He rode a splendid horse that was born for a racer and fed and lodged like a gentleman, kept him at his utmost speed for 10 miles, and then, as he came crashing up to the station where it stood two men holding fast to a fresh impatient steed. The transfer of rider and mail bed was made in a twinkling of an eye and away flew the eager pair and were out of sight before the spectator could hardly get the ghost of a look. Both rider and horse went flying light. The rider's dress was thin and fitted clothes. He wore a roundabout and tucked his pantaloons into his boot tops like a race driver. He carried no arms. He carried nothing that was not absolutely necessary, for even the postage on his literary freight was worth five dollars a letter. His horse was stripped of all unnecessary weight, too. He wore a little wafer of a racing saddle and no visible blanket. He wore light shoes, but none at all. The flat little mail pocket strapped under the rider's thighs was rolled about the bulk of a child's primer. <coughs> they held many and many an important business chapter and newspaper letter, but these were written on paper as airy and thin as gold leaf, nearly. 
and thus hope and wheat were economized. There were about 80 pony riders in the saddle all the time, day and night, stretching in a long, scattering procession from Missouri to California, 40 flying eastward and 40 towards the west. <coughs> and among them making 400 gallant horses, earning a stirring livelihood and see a great deal of scenery every day of the year. We had a consuming desire from the beginning to see a pony rider, but somehow all other passed us and all that met us managed to streak by in the night. So we only heard a whiz and a hail and the swift phantom of the desert was gone before we could get our heads out of the stagecoach windows. But the driver explained, here he comes. <clears throat> and he was gone. <clears throat> From rough times, the Pony Express was only a success for a few years. Then came the telegraph. The stage goes for only a few years and the railroad. What an exciting time to live. Now, I've been throwing, trying to throw some variety into these services. I recently wrote Andrew Carnegie requesting a hymn book. Now, the newspapers got a hold of that letter and printed it under the heading, Mark Twain asked for hymn book. My dear Mr. Carnegie, I can see by the papers you are very prosperous. I want to get a hymn book. It will cost two dollars. I will bless you. God will bless you. And it will do a great deal of good. Very truly yours, Mark Twain. P.S. Don't send me the hymn book. Send me the two dollars. No. <laughs> I wanted to select it myself. I'm not lying to you. I don't tell lies. I differ from George Washington. George Washington could not tell a lie. I can, but won't. <laughs> now, as far as judgment is concerned, I have been told I have good judgment, but that is not the compliment I appreciate. Good judgment comes from experience, which you get from bad judgment. <laughs> it's good to get your mistakes done early. I don't believe in personal improvement. Every improvement you make just creates new problems. That's my <laughs> philosophy. Life is hard. That's just how it is. You can read all the books you want and meditate and reduce stress and lose weight, but the fact is that life is rough. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from making mistakes caused by bad judgment. So the smarter you get, the less you learn, and eventually when you think you got it all figured out, you realize you don't know a thing. <laughs> oh, here's an example. Build a man a fire, and he'll be warm for a day. Set a man on fire, and he'll be warm for the rest of his life. <laughs> the trouble with having an open mind, of course, is that people will insist on coming along and trying to put things in it. It is often said, before you die, your life passes before your eyes. That is a true fact. It's called living. I spent the first four and a half billion years as part of this planet without any complaints whatsoever. It's only been the last 70 years or so where I've had a few issues. There's a rumor going around that I have found God. I think this unlikely because I have enough difficulty finding my keys and there is empirical evidence that they exist. <laughs> you know, I have the blessing of a wife that I have been married to for over 40 years and never once thought of divorce. 
She, of course, has thought of murder many times. <laughs> you know, there's an old familiar old maxim which assures us that man is the noblest work of God. Now, who found that out? Well, I don't think we ought to decide too soon, not until all the returns are in. Well, I won't be here to count them. I'm 70. 70. Last year, I celebrated my 70th escape from the gallows. I am approaching the threshold of age. Well, when you get to be 70, you're supposed to be able to sit up there in that longevity summit and tell the rest of us how to get up there. They all do, you know. All those garrulous old people, they explain the process and dwell on the particulars of senile rapture. Uh, now, I've been trying to explain the system for some time, and I think I have it right. I think I've achieved my 70 years in the usual way by sticking straight to a lifestyle that would kill anybody else. <laughs> now, I have just a few simple rules that I try to follow. I make it a point never to smoke more than one cigar at a time. <laughs> I have no other restrictions. <laughs> I've never smoked any cigars with fancy bands on them, either. They're always too expensive for me. Always smoke the cheap ones. Not reasonably cheap ones. That is, 60 years ago, they cost me $4 a barrel. But my tastes have changed lately, and now I pay 7 no, six or seven. Seven, I think it is. Yes, it's seven, but that includes the barrel. <laughs> now, I've never taken any exercise except sleeping and resting, and I don't ever intend to take any. I could never see the benefit of getting tired. As for diet, I try to be very strict about eating things that don't agree with me until one or the other got the best of it. Last spring, I nearly got the best of myself, but had to stop frolicking with a mince pie after midnight. It nearly exploded in my stomach. No one ever told me the pies were loaded. My basic food is Doritos and whiskey. But the point I'm trying to make is that you cannot reach old age by following another man's road. My habits protect my life, but they probably assassinate you. You've got to make your own rules and then stick to them. It's not as easy as it sounds, because there'll all be someone around trying to reform you, trying to take all the pleasure out of your life and replace it with dreariness, but don't let them. If you can't make 70 by a comfortable road, don't go. <laughs> I'm going to leave my skull to Cornell University so the scientists can examine it and send me a report. <laughs> oh, I suppose it's a good idea to obey the rules when you're young, just so you'll have the strength to break them when you're older, but you cannot forget that experience is the best way to find out something. A fellow who takes a bull by the tail is getting 60 or 70 times as much information as a fellow who hasn't. And anyone who starts in carrying a cat home by the tail is getting knowledge that is always useful. He's never likely to grow dim or doubtful. And chances are he won't carry the cat that way anymore either. But if he wants to carry the cat that way, I say let him. It isn't always easy to be eccentric, you know. Now, let me share a personal perspective of my top ten observations on aging gracefully. One, I talk to myself because sometimes I need expert advice. <laughs> Two, I don't need anger management. I simply need people to stop pissing me off. There you go. Three, my people skills are just fine. It's my tolerance to idiots that oh. makes it work. <laughs> the biggest lie I tell myself I don't need to write that down. I'll remember oh. it. 
Now, if I, when I was a child, I thought nap time was a punishment. Now it's just like a mini vacation. <laughs> but I've also learned number six, even duct tape can't fix stupid. Oh. <laughs> but it can muffle the sound. <laughs> Seven, don't choke, my dear. I don't have the insurance for that. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we could put ourselves in the dryer for 10 minutes, come out wrinkle-free and three sizes small? <laughs> Number eight. Getting lucky <laughs> means walking into a room and remembering why I'm there. <laughs> Number nine, trying to keep track of my passwords is like herding kittens. <laughs> Number 10, I still like road trips. But the restroom seemed to be spaced farther and farther apart. <laughs> what a person needs is some sort of a book of instructions for life. The trouble with life is you don't get a chance to practice it before doing for real. <laughs> now, swearing is another habit I have extensive experience with. And if I can swear and not swear in heaven, I won't be interested in staying there. Of course, they probably won't let me in anyway. So my friends tell me, I'll probably have a very hot time in the front office. <laughs> I remember once saying to our pastor that I hoped to be cremated, and he just looked at me and said, oh, I wouldn't worry about that if I had <laughs> I'm pretty certain there'll be some flames with your head. <laughs> Maybe it won't be so bad down there. When I think of the number of disagreeable people who have gone to a better world, I am silent on the subject because of necessity. I have friends in both places. <laughs> it is a solemn thought. The noblest man's meat is inferior to pork. I am silent on the subject because of necessity. Well, well, now it's time for me to go. My feet are tired, and you look tired. Oh. <laughs> I came into the world with Halley's Comet in 1835. It came again in 1910, and I fully expect to go out with it. It would have been a great disappointment in my life if I didn't go out with Halley's Comet. The Almighty has said, no doubt. Now here are those two indefinable freaks. They came in together. They must go out together. And I did. Good night. Good night. Done. <laughs> you didn't know there's a twenty dollar charge exit this part. I know the show was free. But I wanna give you the important news tonight. My name is actually Rob Alvin. And as you can tell from my accent. I'm clearly born and raised in New York City. <laughs> in fact, my mama and big sister were born in Brooklyn. Yeah. And I was actually, in real life, lived on Long Island, not Long Island, <laughs> where I had a wife, three daughters. And I was a scientist and chief geologist for the region's United, Federal United States Environmental Protection Agency Superfund Division. Mm -hmm. So I was responsible for keeping you guys safe and your drinking water safe. And you spent a lot of time cleaning up and figuring out where contamination had spread in the groundwater. And I 
another reason why I drink whiskey, not water. <laughs> and then about 10 years, 10, 12 years ago, when my one daughter came back from college as a photography major, he said, Daddy, I want you to sit down. I gotta have your model for me. I got an assignment that's due. So she got out of the camera and sat me on a chair and she fluffed out my hair a little bit, combed it back, put me on a sweater, gave me a five, held up my physics book, and she took a picture and it went click. And it was Albert Einstein to the team. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, ha, ha, that's good. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm not done yet. She did another one, curl your hair a little bit, gave me another day, gave, held me, had me hold up a book, Cat's Cradle. <laughs> Staying like this, click. Kurt Vonnegut. And I went, holy cow, it doesn't look anything like Albert Einstein. You're a gentleman, young lady. His daddy needed another one. Oh, take this, I get the sweater off, do this. Oh, put on a tie, blah, blah, blah. Hold up the book, couple of everything. And I held up and it went click. And there was Huckleberry, there was Tom Sawyer standing in front of me. And I went, wow, I can do something with that. So I decided, and I was running a nonprofit at the time, and I decided I rented a hall, and I'm going to do a Holbrook's play. Oh, yeah. Mark Twain Tonight. That's easy. I've done community theater when I was younger. It was easy enough. I'd get the script. We'd rent the hall. We started selling tickets. I'd go down on a business trip with the government down to Philadelphia. Lordy, right in front of a window of a... Army Navy store, I see a whole row of white suits for $69.99. There is a God. I bought one, brought it back with me, and then I go to get the script, and then they told me, there is no script. How Holbrook memorized 50 hours of material and spent decades researching Mark Twain. And I went, oh. <laughs> so I had to make up the script. And I started doing research on Mark Twain. And the more research I started doing, the coarser my voice became. And my hair started, my brain cells just turned white and started oozing out, and out of my skull and giving this coarse growing gray hair. And my mustache got longer. And I developed a propensity for cigars and, and whiskey. And I realized I had a medical affliction. It's called Twainitis Syndrome. Now, it's not dangerous or anything. And the first, as a scientist, I did some research. The first known victim of Twainitis Syndrome was a young man named Samuel Clemens. <laughs> oh, and he only got the white suit after he turned 65. But all photographer shows him in his classic white suit. And then the next victim of Twainitis Syndrome was another man named Al Holbrook. And he has had Twainitis Syndrome for longer than Samuel Clemens did. It's 60 years he's been doing that. He only retired two years ago <laughs> because he went deaf and he couldn't hear audience reaction. He's 94. God bless him. So I'm another victim of Twainitis. I started doing performances and that one went off well. We made some money for the nonprofit. And then somebody else asked me to do it. There was an opera company that needed some funds on Broadway, and an uh, EPA lawyer asked me if I could do that, and I couldn't say no, and she was holding my briefs, <laughs> my legal papers. <laughs> and that went over well, and then there was a guy that was, I knew was a professor from Stony Brook University, and I didn't know he was coming into Manhattan to see me. It turned out he was a fan of the opera company. So little by little, I started doing more. And then one of my part-time jobs was I taught geology at a place called York College, part of the SUNY, City University of New York system in Queens. And I would go to the drive there in the morning, take, park my car in the parking lot, take the train into New York, work for the EPA, take the train back to Jamaica, get off, go teach for three or four hours, and then take the car and go home and grade homework. Mm -hmm. 
but it kept me fun. And then one of their professors said, Rob, you know, you could probably apply for a grant from York. It's for the adjuncts. I went, all right, so I wrote out something. I wrote out a bit this to this. And I submitted it. And the next thing I know, I got notified of a full grant to fly out to Reno, Nevada and spend two weeks in Virginia City, Carson oh. City, the Sierra, and study Mark Twain, uh, Samuel Clemens' failed career oh. as a geology mining prospector, <laughs> including even a visit to Homestake Mines out in there, which was the, the mother load of silver. And my wife came with me, because she didn't trust me to fly alone, especially with wearing my white suit, drinking whiskey all the time. And my daughters came with me, and I had another daughter out there, and we had met another Mark Twain in person here. And we had become lifelong friends. In fact, we split the country between us. He's got the western half, and I got the eastern half. And he's a good guy. So we did that, and uh, but the people, the other professors at York College, and how in the world I try to try grants for seven years and they never get paid? Us. You do one and you got it right away. And I said, well, I just studied Mark Twain and I write great fiction. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked that good. When I got back, I got in touch and they had me do a performance at your college with my white suit. Wow. Now, I was in the physics and geology department, earth science department, and all the hallway, they had a lot of pictures of Albert Einstein. And a few months later, I noticed somebody had ripped down a couple of pictures of Albert Einstein and plastered up pictures of me as Mark Twain along <laughs> the wall. And I said, well, if I ever run out of Mark Twain material, I'm gonna start doing another one on the physics of Albert Einstein. <laughs> Except it's too much science and just a lot too much work, I don't want to do it. So we've had some fun. I've gone out to Kansas City, as Norm Mark introduced us at in Mississippi Riverboats, Lake Tahoe Riverboats, New York, and then recently I came back from my fiftieth high school reunion in Hard City, New York. And on the agenda of the reunion the day before, did a performance at the Senior Center of Mark Twain. Cool. And more people came than I thought they would because I said, are they really just curious? And they said, no, they couldn't believe I was going to do this. Said, no, there's a quiet little scientist who was singing the concert choir a little bit. I said, yeah, well, drugs in the 60s, you know, got to check it out. <laughs> But no, it worked, worked out fine, and when I was done with that, one of my wife and my friends came up, and she gave me a pen of a frog, which I was very touched by, because that's, to me, the jumping frog of Calaveras County, the first book that Mark Twain printed. And then another lady came up to me, and I hadn't seen her for 50 years, and she goes, do you remember me? And I went, Oh, yeah, Julie, Julia. And we talked a few minutes. She didn't even go to the reunion, but she lived locally, heard I was going to do Mark Twain, and she just came in for that. Mm -hmm. We talked and we chatted, and she reminded me of playing tennis with her 55 years ago, and what a clown I was. <laughs> and unfortunately, the epiphany went off and brought back all the memories, and I said, Julia, you had the most beautiful voice. And I thought, you went to France, and we're going to do a career in singing. She said, no, I came back a year later. I said, I never knew that 50 years later. She had gotten married, and now like some of the people are, and she's widowed. And has a stepson. He lives nearby, and I say, well, God bless you. Continue singing. Get back to it. Works out fine. Now, I'm going to stop here. There are some cookies in the back, although I noticed some people burn up again. And also my experiences as Mark Twain are copied in a book called Catching Twinitis Syndrome. It's for sale tonight for $15. Susie is my wife. Raise your hand again. She's back there. She can take your money. I'll be happy to see her take it. 
I'll never see it, but that's okay. <laughs> also, if you want a photograph of Mark Twain, do that. And uh, uh, the reason I do this, Samuel Clemens died in 1910, but Mark Twain will live forever. Yes. Yes.